Hi everyone, my name is Taylor. I work in marketing here at Random House um, and I will be our host for today's Instagram Live session, um, The Writer's Routine with Kali Fajardo Anstein. We will get Kali up here with us in just a moment, just a minute. Um, first, I'm gonna pin a comment to the top here so anyone tuning in later will know what is going on and then we'll get started. While we wait for Kali to join us, feel free to drop your questions in there. Tell me where you're tuning in from, what you've been reading, how your life is going. We'll try to get through as much as we can in our 20 minutes today. Let's see if we have Kali here yet. Sometimes it just takes a minute. Not quite yet. For those of you who do not know, she is the author of Sabrina and Karina, which is just an incredible short story collection. We should have Kali here in just a second. Here we go. Hi. Hi, Taylor. It's nice to see you. It's so nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to, to be on the live with you. Yes. Um, well, I have to tell you that I personally am such a fan of your story collection. I always want to call it a novel because it reads so fluidly and I can read it in one sitting, but it is a story collection. Um, yes, it is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Yeah. Do you want to start by telling our listeners a little bit about your story collection? Sure. So I am Kali Fajardo Anstein, and I am the author of Sabrina and Karina Stories. Sabrina and Karina is a collection of 11 short stories that focus on the lives of Chicanas of Indigenous ancestry, who are also mixed from here in Denver, Colorado, where I still live to this day. Um, the stories span girls and women, um, their lives from anywhere from the ages of 10 years old all the way to up to their 80s. And it came a lot out of my own upbringing and my childhood and my community here in Colorado. Yeah, I definitely want to dive into a lot of that, especially your characters, because there are so many amazing characters in this collection. Um, but since this is called The Writer's Routine, do you want to start by telling us a little bit about your writing routine? Yeah, I, I would love to. So I'm, I'm over here in my, my office. You can kind of see it. I don't want to like, like it. it. I'll make it all fall apart. Um, <laughs> So um, basically, like my whole apartment is just set up in order to help me be a better writer. Um, so I have my bookshelf that's right next to my desk where I work. I got an additional monitor so I can edit my forthcoming novel on my big monitor. So usually what my day looks like is I wake up, I start answering emails on my phone in bed, and I should not do that. Um, <laughs> You should not, I would not recommend that. That's a bad morning routine. Um, but then after I send through my emails and I have my coffee and I have some water and stuff, I go for like a long walk. And that walk can be anywhere from like an hour to two hours. It's really long. I know it's kind wow. of kind of crazy. But that's where I work out a lot of my stories in my mind. And then I come back and I have lunch and I try to start writing. And I, I recently moved over from writing in the middle of the night to trying to start... <laughs> trying to start like a little bit earlier like in the evening so sure. I can be done like around midnight instead of four in the morning <laughs> oh I feel like my reading habits have totally changed in the pandemic I feel like there are no rules anymore and I can be up in the middle of the night reading and it doesn't matter anymore um, yeah I mean it's kind of like <laughs> what is time anymore but <laughs> yeah exactly um well that sounds like a very healthy well-established routine which is yes amazing. I've had many years of practice <laughs> Um, and I definitely want to hear more about this upcoming novel. I know that's like the number one question we're going to get, um, but we can save that for a treat at the end, maybe. Yeah, let's save, let's save that because um, I, I don't even know yet how to talk about it. I'm scared <laughs> that it's almost done. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. I would love to hear about where you get your inspiration for your stories and if they come from different places and that you mentioned your life in Denver um, and your culture is kind of a big part of that. But if there's any like specific little tidbits you want to share. Yeah, so I'm a writer who really draws from her own life for my short stories and for my, my forthcoming book. Um, and what that means is I just, I look for inspiration in my daily life. Um, I never have writer's block because I think that there are stories all around us. For example, the opening story in Sabrina and Karina's Sugar Babies, which a lot of readers really love that story. I really had to raise my own little sugar baby in school, <laughs> but I didn't have a partner like Robbie, so I had to do it all alone. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like Solana in the story. She's like all alone. Um, and so that story really did come out of my own life. Some of the darker stories as well are, can come from experiences in my community and in my, my ancestors' lives. 
And I, I think it's really important, especially if you come from a Latina or Chicana or indigenous background, we haven't really seen our stories broadcasted in a big way across the world before in literature. And so yeah. it's really important to me that I get to tell stories about my daily life and people like me, their daily lives. Sometimes people will tell me, nothing really happens in your stories, just slice a life. And I'm like, well, I think a lot is happening. Um, but I also think that's good because that means that we're allowed to just have stories about what it means to exist and to be human. Yeah, definitely. And that, that speaks to kind of the big emotional range of your collection, too. Some of the stories um, are very funny and witty and biting. And then, you know, some are a bit darker and grittier. Um, and can, how, how did you balance those different emotions throughout the book? Yeah, that's a really good question, Taylor. So one question I get a lot from readers, they'll ask me, are you more like Sabrina or are you more like Karina? And I always, I always have to think, well, I'm like both of those people in different times in my life. Um, and so I do think that it's important that we balance. We're not always very serious people. We're not always depressed people. I've struggled with depression in my life a lot, but I also have a very humorous side. I'm very lighthearted at times. And I think in order to feel the full breadth of human emotions, it's important that we, we look at all aspects of human life. Um, and sometimes that's happy and sometimes it's very dark and difficult to deal with, but we can't have the goodness without the negative. And across a lot of different age ranges too, you know, you have the 13 year old, then you also have, I think well, an 80 year old woman, I may have gotten that exact age wrong, but there really <laughs> is that breadth of life in the collection too, with a lot of different, um, you know, important moments and kind of moments of change too. I was, I was so impressed by how, how do you capture their different voices? And I mean, I, I have so many questions about these characters in general, but I'll just start there. That's, I, I love that you noticed that, that I'm, I'm interested in people of all ages. Um, some of my best friends are the elderly, like elders, I love them. They have so much knowledge <laughs> and so much information and they're so kind and they're, you know, they're so willing to help us learn and tell us about their life and the things that they've been through. So the character you're referencing, Perla in Galapagos, she's, she's in her mid eighties and she's still, you know, one of the things she says in that story is that I still want to live rather than die. Mm -hmm. And I think that speaks to the heart of what it means to be a human and to be alive is that we have this drive to keep living our life, even in the face of just great, great adversity. Um, and then when it comes to the children in the stories, there are a lot of child narrators as well. I come from a really big family. I have six brothers and sisters. Well, I have five sisters and one brother. And <laughs> I was just, a, I'm the second oldest. And so I was always around children growing up. I have so many cousins. There were two sets of twins in my family. So I always was taking care of babies. And I just, I love being around like lots of life and characters of all walks of life. Amazing. So I'm gonna do a quick little pause here um, for anyone who's just tuning in. This is Random House live with Carly Fajardo and Stein. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Is it Anne Stein? Yeah, yes, you okay. are. Thank Amazing. you for asking. I appreciate that, Taylor. <laughs> well, I called um, your marketer, Katie Toll, right before this and wanted to confirm. So I just want to make sure <laughs> I correctly. I was like, I hope my own publisher gets my name right. And look, he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, and Kali is the author of Sabrina and Karina. If you have any questions for her about her writer's routine or about this book, feel free to drop those in the comments here. And I love that you have it displayed. I have my e-reader, which is not as beautiful. But, um, and maybe we should talk about the cover. How did this cover come to be? Yeah, so this cover is by the artist Gustavo Rimada. He's a Mexican-born artist who lives now, I believe, in Palm Springs. Um, the way that I found this cover is super interesting, and I think it speaks to the heart of Sabrina and Karina. One of my best friends is named Nayeli, and she is a makeup artist. And she needed someone for her portfolio to model makeup looks. And so she was doing my makeup one morning and I looked across the room of her apartment and I just saw this gorgeous print on the wall. And I, I got like this feeling, I got like that sparky chills feeling. And I was like, he will do my cover. I don't know how, but he will do it. And sure enough, we contacted him, Random House contacted him and he was willing to help out and, and let us use this beautiful print, Mother of the Land is what the original oh. print is. And he, Gustavo Rimada actually created this print to raise funds for the women who were supporting Standing Rock. Um, so it just, it speaks so much to the collection. It's become, uh, I love seeing when women and anybody recreates this. It's just, it's so cool. And I love my cover. So <laughs> thank you for asking about it. It's, it's so beautiful. And I love, um, 
what was the name of the prince that it's mother of the land is that right mother mother of the land mother of the land. that's beautiful um and speaking of instagram you're sort of a a bookstagram darling i feel like i'm always seeing this book in my feed um and i'm wondering if you have any fun stories of like really crazy recreations of the cover and i bet that you can share I, I think like, okay, anytime anyone recreates my cover, I'm just like blown away. I'll just like stare at my phone for like 10 minutes. And I'm like, I can't <laughs> believe someone's doing this. This is so cool. Um, I, there have been so many beautiful recreations. Recently, somebody posted their little girl, like little, little girl, like three years old, and she recreated the cover. And I was like, okay, she can't be reading this though. It's too, it's too violent for her. <laughs> it's too little, but, but I am really excited. I'm really excited about the idea of Chicanas being able to see themselves in this cover. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to cover like this because I, I've been in, around books my whole life. I was a bookseller and it's very rare that you walk past a book and you do a double take and you're like, I look like the girl on the cover of that book. You know, yeah. as a Chicana, that was so important to me that women could just stop and say, oh my gosh, that looks like my auntie, that looks like my mom, that is, that is somebody that I know. Um, and so any recreation, you're part of the family of the covers. So I love all the recreations. So thank you to all the bookstagrammers doing that. Yeah, doing the best work. Um, and that moment of really seeing yourself reflected in art and in literature is such a profound experience, especially when it's not a common experience. Um, and all of your characters, I or most of your main characters are Latinx, indigenous women who are both flawed, but very strong. Um, and I wonder if you want to kind of talk about that decision and what that means for you as a writer. Yeah, it's it's super important to me. Um, so in addition to my characters being Latinx and indigenous, they also are mostly mixed. They usually are half white because I, I have a white father. And so when I was growing up, I never saw books that ever talked about that experience of being in the midst of different identities. And my identity to me was just the way I lived. It was normal. And I, I just couldn't believe that there were no other stories that existed about us. And I now know that that's not true, that plenty of us are writing books, we're writing poetry, we're writing plays, but it's been very hard to get published. And so to have a book like Sabrina and Karina reach as many readers as it has and to have its life in the world, it's just so significant. And if I were to go back in time and I were to find my own work at 15 or 14 years old, you know, this is the book that would have changed my life. And so I hope that other young Chicanas are finding my book, but I also hope it's inspiring other women to pick up the pen and start telling their own stories because it's so important that we have your voices coming to the table. Um, the, the days of like going into the library and not being able to find any book written by your own voice, I don't want that to happen anymore. I want there to be a lot of books to choose from. And that really kind of reflects all of the different experiences that people have, even if they're from the same broader culture. You know, they're not, not everyone has that same life experience. Um, again, for everyone who's just tuning in, this is Random House live with Kali Fajardo Anstein talking about Sabrina and Karina and her writer's routine. Let's see if we have any questions here. One. Oh, this is a fun one. Um, someone would like to know what you're reading right now or what you've been reading recently. Yeah, so I've been reading quite a few different things. I, I've been lucky to, I've been interviewing different authors for different Instagram lives and things like that. So I recently read The Lost Children Archive by Valeria Luiselli. And that, that was oh, just so good. interesting. Yeah, that was just so um, interesting to read about, you know, coming to the Southwest from elsewhere. Um, from the East Coast and coming down. I also was reading Edwidge Danticat's um, Everything Inside, just so blown away always by her craft and her genius. Um, and a book that I've been recommending a lot lately, especially for Latinx Heritage Month, is An African American and Latinx People's History of the United States by Dr. Paul Ortiz. And, oh, it's right here. So I've been reading, <laughs> so I would recommend everybody get a, a copy of this book. Um, I just, I really appreciate the way that it's recentering how we think of American history. Amazing. I'll definitely have to go buy myself a copy of that for myself after this. Um, we have another great question here. Do you have any advice for aspiring writers? Yeah, my advice for aspiring writers is to read as much as possible and to stay current on the books that are coming out. Because if your goal is to get published, it's important to know how those books are coming into the world. And something you can do that, I mean, this was a trick that I used. And I, I come from 
Denver, Colorado. I don't come from any connections in publishing. And if I can do it, like literally you guys can do it too. <laughs> so one of the tricks that I used is I would always read the acknowledgement section in the back of books because then I could find out who someone's editor was or who someone's agent was. And if they didn't thank those people, they probably weren't um, writers that I like, you know, I liked their work too much because I really like grateful writers. <laughs> so yeah. um, if you're reading the back of the acknowledgements, it'll kind of give you an idea of the team behind a book. And that'll give you something to aim for with your own work. That's really great advice. I personally love the acknowledgements pages. That you kind of gives like a glimpse into the author themselves. Yeah, themselves. yeah, I love it. It's like an extra treat at the end of the book. Yes, I was doing a little reading around before um, our live today, and I found this sentence that said that you set out in your collection to understand why beauty and death are so closely linked. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what you found or what you kind of discovered from that experience. I think this is a question that is really ongoing for me because a lot of my work does deal with themes of mortality. And as I grow older and my parents grow older, I'm thinking more and more about death and how we honor our ancestors. My family celebrates Dia de los Muertos. We build altars um, every year for Day of the Dead. And we, you know, we tell stories and we remember our ancestors. And so I feel very close to ancestors of mine who passed before I was even born. And so I think um, time is the ultimate boundary that we have. And it's just something that I'm just continually thinking about. And I, I do think it has to do with my indigenous heritage and also being raised Catholic. <laughs> I think, you know, seeing the crucifix is like one of the ultimate symbols of your life as soon as you're born in the Catholic hospital. Um, <laughs> and so it's just something I'm always going to be exploring my, in my work. It's like the big, big question and I, I haven't found the exact answer yet. And when I do, I don't, I don't know if I'll be on this plane. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, it's not an easy one. <laughs> Um, well, we're almost out of time here today, but I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit about the novel that you're working on. Yes, I would love to. So the novel's in progress. I'm not sharing the title anymore because I don't know if I want to change it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know yet. Um, so the novel, I've been working on it for almost seven years, I believe. I actually started it before Sabrina and Karina, but my skill level as, as a writer was not where I needed it to be to tackle the subject matter. So Woman of Light, which is what I've been calling it, <laughs> is the story of my family's migration from Southern Colorado into Denver in the 1920s. And it takes a look at racial injustice, working as a woman alone during the depression without the help of a male figure in the home. And it looks at the multiculturalism and the plurality of my identity and my ancestors who created me. Um, and so I'm really excited. It has Filipino characters because I'm part Filipino. It has indigenous characters, Chicano characters, Greek characters, Anglo characters. It's a wild, like, 1930s noir. I'm excited for you guys to read it. <laughs> I can't wait okay. to read it. Um, awesome. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been such a treat for me and for our viewers. Um, we really appreciate your time. Thank you guys so much. Bye. Bye.